Hello, Gaz Williams here for Sonic State, and tonight I'm at St George's Hall in Bristol for a concert celebrating the music of Barry Gray. Who's Barry Gray? Barry Gray is the composer behind those wonderful Super Mario Nation series by Jerry Anderson. So that's Thunderbirds, uh, Stingray, Captain Scarlet, Space 1999, UFO, big list. And it's terrific, dynamic, exciting music, and it's going to be performed by an orchestra. It's the Charles Hazelwood all-star collective who are going to be performing with a couple of very special guests including Jarvis Cocker and Adrian Utley from Portishead. But the reason we're here is that it's also going to feature two rather special rare electronic instruments as well. What are they? Well, you'll have to come with me and we'll go and find out. And you remember that sound, the sound of the Mr. Ons? Well, that comes directly from this very strange instrument just behind me here, which looks like a collection of furniture from Granny's boudoir. But in fact, it's a first-generation electronic instrument designed in the late 1920s called an Orne Martineau. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about how it works. It has many and various guises. It can whir, it can fart, it can burble, it can shriek. It can do unearthly things to you, ladies and gentlemen, especially in the hands of the great Francois Evans. What's more, ladies and gentlemen, we have Barry Gray's own Orne Martineau here on this stage with us right now. This is the very instrument that created the sound of the Mr. Ons. Here we are in St. George's Hall. I've got with me Francois Evans, who is a Ond Martineau player. Ond Martineau? Well, let's have a look. So, Francois, could you give us a little explanation, a little small history of this wonderful, beautiful instrument? Uh, the Ond Martineau um, is a French invention invented in 1928 by Maurice Martineau, mm -hmm. um, who was a musician who dabbled in a bit of science. Um, and there are seven um, incarnations of the Orne Martineau, of which this one is number six. This was the last valve instrument right. um, to be made. It was a little bit smaller than its predecessor. Do we know what year this is actually, was actually manufactured in? This instrument could have come from any date between around 1953 up to about 1970. I think it right. dates around the 60s. I don't have okay. the exact date for okay. it, but it was bought in 1969. Okay, yeah. and, and the, this instrument itself has some very special history, doesn't it? Because it, it, it belonged to Barry Gray. It did. Barry Gray was using it from um, very early on when he was working with Jerry Anderson. Mm -hmm. Its sound is a characteristic feature of um, quite a lot of, of his music. Some, sometimes eerie sounds, and sometimes gentle floating sounds. Oh, well, before we... Uh, before we get a little sort of explanation of the instrument, can we just hear something? Maybe sure. something that, 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 that is from one of the Barry Gray soundtracks. Okay. Beautiful. So I noticed there you were actually rocking the keys uh, left and right. Is there a vibrato on the, key, the uh, keyboard? Yeah, it's amazing to play because you hardly need to move physically to make often quite big changes in the sound. Mm -hmm. So um, with this, which is the um, central heart, if you like, of, of the Jorn Martineau, um, this is like a bow on a stringed instrument. So an Jorn Martineau is much more like a cello than it is a piano. Um, and within about two centimeters, you can go from a super soft to a very loud. You can hear that. So um, you have to be very sensitive when you play. There are screws here which can release the keyboard so that it, it swings slightly and you can get a nice vibrato out of it, which is something that pianists would, I'm sure, love to be able to do on their instruments. And it's a, it's a rocking motion. just hear that. Um, 
what's strange, I, I studied piano and it takes a while to get out of the habit of trying yeah. to press harder on the keys to get a louder sound. That doesn't work. It's mm -hmm. not velocity sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, that's all done by your right. left hand. Left that's hand. right. And, and of course, there's the, the, the ring ribbon. Yes, ribbon is the other way of playing. So yeah. you switch this switch here and that takes the Martineau into yeah. ribbon mode. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's um, for doing sliding sounds. So. And you know what note you're playing yeah. by this part here, which is a ah, braille keyboard. Yeah. Really? So the little dips inside are the white notes, uh -huh. and the brass pin heads, they're the black oh. notes. So you feel with your finger, and you know wow. when, when you've found the note. So for doing soft and legato passages, you'd play with ribbon, and then for doing faster passages, which have got lots of changing notes, you'd switch to keyboard, because it's safer that way. Martineau's got quite a wide range. It can get right, right down to farty sounds here. <laughs> Amazing. So in terms of its uh, uh, timbral kind of uh, adjustment sounds, yes. How, what have we got in terms of controls for that side of things? There are three parts for controlling the timbre of the instrument. The first main part are the choice of three loudspeakers. Um, they're, they're called diffuseurs in French. Diffuseur. Yeah. Okay, and these are these over here? These are them here. Yep. So, um, number one um, oh, yeah. is a cone speaker, a standard uh, cardboard cone speaker, which is down here. Um, and then above that you have what's called a balm. So this, that's, that's for a much more metallic, brighter element. Um, yes, it's got 12 guitar strings, front and back, which are tuned to the chromatic notes of an octave. Um, and the strings, you, you don't pluck or bow them, they just vibrate in sympathy, sympathy. with a resonator at the bottom of the palm speaker. Mm. Um, the metallic is similar to the palm. Mm -hmm. Again, it has a resonator at the top. But that's connected to a Chinese gong, <laughs> um, so that gets you your uh, metallic sound. Oh, the metallic sound, right, okay. <laughs> it's a very evocative sound, isn't it? Mm. Beautiful. And the, the last um, two parts for controlling the colour of the sound yep. are these um, switches. Mm -hmm. which are, could I mention those? Yep. Um, one, uh, number one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven is in here uh, with a rocking um, perspex uh, stick to switch it on and off. Mm -hmm. Eight and zero is here. And those are just overtones um, with different oscillators which switch in and out to change the colour of the sound. Um, and lastly, on this model of Martineau, there's a <laughs> knee pedal underneath, ah. which is just a filter. Wow. So you can control the brightness of the sound. Ah. Yeah, lo lovely. Um, and that's it. Really? That's a, oh, absolutely fantastic. Thanks so much for showing us. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Now it's time to introduce you to another very extraordinary electronic instrument which uh, Adrian Utley uh, has in front of him here. Um, I can say only that it looks a bit like something you might find in a gentleman's study in about 1940. It has sort of knobs and bits of leather. Don't take that the wrong way. <laughs> and a sort of green metallic background to it. It's very peculiar, but it is called a Swarmatron. Ladies and gentlemen, it's capable of many things. So we've got Adrian Utley here, which is uh rather a special treat and he has got something absolutely incredible to show us which is um a swarmatron swarmatron now secret weapon secret weapon yeah. and this is a this isn't a vintage instrument is no, it no it looks like one doesn't yeah. it yeah yeah um it's made by amazingly brilliant they're cousins ah, right. and strangely when i played in oxford with will's moog group mm -hmm. an american guy came up and said you've got a swarmatron and i went 
yeah, how do you know? He said, well, it's my brother that makes them. Fantastic. How weird is that? Yeah. So anyway, they're, they're, yeah, they're quite, they're very limited. You have to wait. I ordered it. Me and Will Gregory <laughs> ordered one around the same time. Is that an ignition key? <laughs> it is, to start it. The lights <laughs> stopped working, so oh, no. that's a bit of a drag, but I okay. just need to change the bulb. Yeah, it's a bit of an odd. That's an interesting thing. Yeah. Uh, so just uh, in a nutshell, how, how, how would you describe it? It's, um, well, it's, it's part of their amazing kind of um, thought about electronic instruments. It's very kind of playable. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's hard to play it in the right key, you know, because it's not, you'll see in a minute, it's really not mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Although it has got CV and gate inputs, and we okay. can talk about that on your site, can't we? Absolutely. People, <laughs> if you're doing it, talking to the Guardian, yeah, yeah. they just sort of glaze yeah, over. Oh, no, 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 we love so that. It's got CV and gate stuff in, and, you know, yep. so. So you can actually, uh, if you get the right voltage, yep. get it to play with the keyboard, which I will do, mm. because the sound is completely brilliant, and it would be amazing to have it to be able to play with other instruments pitch-wise. But it's an, it's, um, it's an eight oscillator. It's got eight oscillators. Fantastic. Um, and this ribbon here is for pitch, mm -hmm. and this is for swarm. It's why it's called swarm. a swarmatron. Right. Um, and what it does, the eight oscillators, if you switch them all on, mm -hmm. which I do, mm -hmm. um, and they spread out. Okay. But they don't all go up to the next note. Some no. of them come down to the next note. Uh, so it's a very complex yeah. swarm of bees. <laughs> Lovely. First time I heard about it was mm -hmm. somebody, a producer in London, and it was an after show, and everybody was saying, You've got to see this thing, man. <laughs> it's a swarmatron. And I was going, what does it sound like? It sounds like bees, man. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, it sounds like bees. It sounds like know? bees. So there's a, there's, a few ti there's a few traditional things. We've got an ADSR envelope there. Yep. And I, I guess some sort of frequency. That That's like a the frequency. That's like a this is a cue, like yep. resonance. Yep. This is the filter amount that this will, mm -hmm. um, you know, do. This is the, I think this is the envelope, filter right. envelope, yep. which is the same. Um, there and this is drive so you can drive it super uh, it's got frequency modulation yeah wow um pulse width i think no um yes and then what's this <laughs> using stuff at the moment. <laughs> it's got loads of stuff and um right wow and are those are those are switches are they to turn on the oscillators they are so yeah. should i do it yes please so you can hear if i switch them all off they're all off now mm -hmm. so have i got any yeah so we should hear this okay and that's so then you switch in a, I'll put it into unison now And then the, what the coolest thing with it is yeah. that it, it, these oscillators can then spread out, so... Ah, the swarm. And you get the swarm, yeah. so... And this will change. That's changing the, how much, the width of the swarm. So and then, you know, oh, wow. so it's really cool. It's got a great envelope as well. I haven't got any effects really on this, but you mm -hmm. can put it through reverb echoes. Um, and get a nice little... Nice. If you want. What a sound. To me, it just sounds like old school electronics, yeah. you know. But it is very modern. So also, it has um, frequency modulation as well. So if we go there... Um, these switches will switch one of these in to, os um, to frequency modulate the others. So if I switch it there, that oscillator is now going to affect all the other ones with this control. That's it, it's on. <laughs> so, so you're getting like ring modulating, frequency modulated stuff. Hear that kind of noise. So it wow. quickly turns into white noise because it's just yeah. massive yeah. loads of stuff, you know. Um, it's 
got a strange orchestral sound to it, though, in a, in, I think, in, in yeah. a bizarre kind of way, hasn't it? Well, I checked it out a lot before I bought it, because they're very expensive, mm -hmm. and you have to wait about a year and a half to get it, mm -hmm. which is, um, and there's no bypassing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, yeah, it is. It's kind of, I think it's in the same, it's not, I mean, the Ons is a completely beautiful instrument. Yeah. And um, actually, Francois just brought, brought me some motor, motor driver things for, to make a metallic speaker, um, which we were going to make. I'm going to make one for Will as well. Wow. Um, so this can go through that. And then, oh, yeah. You know. Wow. <laughs> I love it. I've played yeah. it. I've played it. I've tracked up loads of them <laughs> all, in almost unison. So, I might just do that. So, you've got an oscillator, but it's slightly out. Yeah. And then I would track another one in a different note, you know. So, you've got this incredible kind of. I've done it on a few film soundtracks and stuff. So, it, and, it, and it isn't, you know, in terms of the pitching, you are, it is only that you, you're not ever trying to find pitches on it as No, such. I'm not at the moment right. because it's really hard to do that. These yeah. are the tuning. There's fine tuning and that's big tuning. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've got no idea where that is. You <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah. So, uh, that's why I think it would be good to have a keyboard if you wanted to mm -hmm. approach that world, you know, of, being, of yeah, getting in pitches. with other people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which I think is quite useful. Ask how you're using it within the context of the music for tonight's show. Well, to, tonight it's really there's one. It's only on one piece. I, I did used to use it as kind of interludes in between. Right. You know, when we played at Glastonbury, I just made a massive racket with it. You know? <laughs> and this sounds amazing for a big PA. It really <laughs> yeah. does. Um, but um, tonight we've got this tune called the Trip, uh, which is, you know, one of Barry Gray's tunes. It's one of the sort of slightly later, kind of a bit groovy and very odd. Mm. And there's a section where the Ons and the Swarmatron and the uh, Farfisa organ would just play a little bit of kind of spooky world. Right. <laughs> Charles Hazelwood, who's the direct, uh, well, the musical director and com and conductor of the of the show tonight. So, the music of Barry Gray. Then, when did you first become aware of that? Well, I've known Barry Gray's music ever since I was a kid. Like right. all of us, you know, yeah. I watched it on my little black and white TV set at home. I suppose in the early seventies, mid seventies. And the thing was, I was totally wrapped in raptures by the music, but I never ever heard it through anything other than a tiny little TV speaker. Mm -hmm. So it was only when Denny Eiler, one of the other guitarists in, in our group, suggested a couple of years ago, we were on tour in Poland, I think, and we were standing out the back of the stage door, and he said, why don't we ever look at Barry Gray's music? And I was like, who's Barry Gray? Right. Because of course, like many people, yeah. I'd never heard of him, even yeah. though I know all the music. Mm -hmm. As soon as I realized who Barry Gray was, and I was like, oh my goodness, yes. And in a way, what we're doing here, I feel, mm -hmm. given that all of us experience it just through that tinny speaker, <laughs> yeah. is we're creating a kind of technicolor version. It's almost like restoring an old master, stripping <laughs> yeah, away all the, the tinny crap and hearing it in its original yeah. lustrous uh, primary color quality. I mean, when we came in and, and you were midway through some of the rehearsals, you know, the sound, I mean, I, it, what struck me was how kind of avant-garde and exciting and and it didn't sound like sort of music from a children's TV Not show. Not a bit. You know. I couldn't agree more. I mean, you tell me another person that could mash together the four kind of principal elements that Gray, that Gray does so superbly well. You've got big band swagger, no doubt, kind of a sense of a bit of, you know, there's Ellington, Tommy Dorsey, that kind of vibe. Then you've got this amazing sci-fi quality with the <laughs> On Martino, the Swarmatron, other instruments of the kind of old school electronic variety. Then you've got a kind of a liberal dosing of kind of Hollywood sparkle, <laughs> bit kitschy, bit Mantovani. And then finally, but by no means least, you've yeah. got really tacky 60s pop. 
Bebop driving through all of yeah. it. Think no further than the monkeys, in a yeah. way. All of that bound together. Who knew that it could be such compelling music? And I really don't think there's a person on the planet that's done it as well as Barry Gray. There is so much music for all the Super Mario Nation shows. We're not even presenting all of all of the material here tonight. Okay. I mean, for start, something that's interesting about him as a film composer is that he composed every single pickup cue. There was no kind of team of people no. who would do the kind of boring little odds and sods, right. a little bit of underscore here and there. Right. Every last bar, as far as I know, was written by him. Wow. And let's remember yeah. that in addition to Thunderbirds and Stingray and Captain Scarlet, you've also got Fireball XL5, you've mm. got Supercar, you've got UFO. Wow. There's so many. He's had Space 1999 as well. There you go, wow. absolutely another one as well I mean a remarkable guy but the fact is people don't know his name yeah. because I guess he was one of those wonderful people he didn't need to shout that it was Barry Gray <laughs> he was only in service of those amazing stories and those amazing miniature characters I think he's you know his time has come round at last and that <laughs> hopefully the world is really going to wake up and of course we all see Jerry Anderson's work as extraordinary and yeah. and, and sort of you know it sort of changed the world on its axis slightly in a way <laughs> um, but to really see properly to see and to recognise and to lift up high the genius of Barry Gray. And now, we've got a rather special guest, Mr Jarvis Cocker. Hello there. Hello. Hi. So Jarvis, I mean, the show tonight about the music about Barry Gray, mm. how were you aware of about Barry Gray? Was he someone who was on your radar? Um, well, I, I heard the music in shows when I was a kid, you know, but I probably wouldn't know who'd written it. <laughs> I kind of got to know it a, a bit more when I was older, I suppose. But I've, I've come quite late to this project. I was supposed to be involved the last show that they did, but then I fell ill. So <laughs> today's the first day that I've been here. But I've, I've been sat watching the rehearsal and... Uh, kind of uh, blew me away a bit really mm. because the, I suppose it's a combination of the fact that you've got that music lodged in your brain somewhere from a very early age and then you're hearing it actually played probably as yeah. pretty similar to the way in which they would have recorded it in the first place you know yeah in the big orchestral you room know, and it's the combination of the instruments and the complexity of the arrangements is something that only really becomes apparent when you you've seen people play it, you know. Mm -hmm. so. so you'll be singing uh, a couple of songs tonight. Uh, if you can call it singing, yes. <laughs> so I'm tempted to. What, what, what will we be hearing? Uh, you'll be hearing, there's a song called The Dangerous Game, which is one that I wasn't familiar with. That was originally sung by Lady Penelope. Wow. Yeah. Um, she was my favourite character in Thunderbirds. I thought that um, the kind of masculinity of Thunderbirds was a bit suspect, with the, the dad tell, telling all his, making all his sons work for him. And there was no Mrs. Tracy, as far as I can remember. So right. I thought that was a weird setup. But, yeah. And Lady Penelope was a, a welcome kind of feminine influence in there. So uh, I'm glad to be singing one of her songs. <laughs> and then I, I think maybe the reason why Charles asked me to be involved was. Um, the song Aquamarina, I, I sang that quite recently at a BBC prom uh, back in September. And, and um, that song means a lot to me because when I was a kid, I was in, that was my first crush was, was Marina from Stingray. Wow. And I, my mum, she got a doll from the market and she made a costume for it and I used to carry it around everywhere apparently. Wow. So, um, Amazing. So it's good to be able to sing yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, you've got a special. There's another guest singing uh, with you as well during that song. Um, yeah, Victoria. She's she's she can really sing. Cool. She does yeah. this kind of uh, like vocalese. Is that what you call it? You know, when you kind of sing without words, wordless singing. And so she does all the kind of <laughs> kind of stuff. <laughs> Stuff you kind of took it for granted because it was on TV. 
Yes. And I suppose it, something like this makes you realise the amount of work and, and, and complexity and creativity that went into it, you know. It's pretty amazing, really. Um, I suppose for something that would have been considered very throwaway, a kids' TV programme, yeah. to have that much uh, sophisticated, inventiveness yeah. and sophistication in the, in the music is, is quite something, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Jarvis. Thank you very much. And All right. have a great show tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.